Everybody doing? Hello and thank you for being here. Where is my drop down window? There we go. Okay. So today I want to say uh, thanks for being here once again, as always, of course. And today is uh, three things you must know about. It's, I said British blues because, hey, you guys know I'm a big fan of the British blues, but it's three things you must do to make your blues playing much more uh, legitimate, better, and cool. And I, I've talked about these things a few times. I think I talk about them pretty much every week. But I want to uh, specifically talk about them today. And I learned them all from Eric Clapton. Uh, so that would be um, why I call it the British Blues thing. All right, so today, all my courses, as usual, Live 25, on my website, if you enter Live 25, you will get 25% off only through my website. So. Um, if you do that, that'd be great. I got a new course out, Uptown Blues, which I'm really, I really like. I like all my courses. And um, in the can is a new True Fire course that will I have a to-be-determined date. And that will be coming out, uh, like I said, I got to figure out when that's going to come out. But um, it's actually inspired by the stuff we've been doing on the, uh, the lockdown. It's a pentatonic, it's inspired by the pentatonic lockdown sessions I did. So we're going to do extended pentatonic jams. Uh, go deeper into what I did here with tabs and notation, and back on tracks, and all that kind of stuff. So it'll be cool. It'll be cool. Uh, Phil Mingan, um, the wonderful moderator, as always. Okay. So um, thanks for the uh, little uh, sloppy on the top. Haven't played in a few days. <laughs> so, all right. So the first thing we want to do, we're thinking, I played primarily G minor pentatonic. Right? talk about the, the gear in a minute. Um, so we're playing over a G blues, right? The first thing we want to think about is on a G minor pentatonic, which is G, B flat, C, D, E. Sorry, no. One more time. G, B flat, C, D, F, right? G, there's that B flat, C, D, F, and G. A little intonation stuff going on. Cheap guitars. Okay. Um, if you play G7, we have a B natural in it. But in a G blues scale, G minor blues scale, we have a B flat. 
So the first thing we want to do in any blues situation is to tweak our flatted third. Um, and you want to spend a lot of time working on this, uh, like I did, and I still do. So... As opposed to... Right, so getting that flat three... Right? I gotta make the stink face. But check out the difference, guys. I'm just gonna play that same kind of groove, and I am gonna just keep on playing that flat three, natural three tweak, and go back between being in and out, so. Ah. Gotta get the pots fixed on this. Now, I'm not going to bend that beef flat at all. Ooh, now bend it. Right then. Keep on bending that beef flat here. Stakes are free. Right, so all I'm doing is bending my B flat, just a hair. I'm not quite making it to B. I'm alluding to the B, but I kind of stop before I get there. So one of the real tricks is to keep the bend going until I get to my next note, or to stop this. Right? See, it, I don't release, I don't go. That sounds terrible. I'll go. And then ma wait until I get to my next pitch that I want to get to, then I get off of that bend. Or... But uh, the other thing is I can just stop it. And how do I stop it? I'm literally putting my hand down on a string. Oftentimes I'm just putting the pick down. Like. Right? Right? That little bend, that little tweak makes all the difference in the world. Like, it's so huge. If you don't do it, I can just, okay, right. the three things I'm going to talk about today, if I don't hear a guitar player do them, I, I don't have, I can't listen to that guitar player. And these are ways that you can get your playing to be that much better with, uh, I don't want to say a little effort, with, with three little kind of tweaks. So the way to practice this is to find, say we pick a key, in this case I'm playing a G blues, and I'm finding every B flat, and I'm going to bend it that little bit, and I'm going to resolve it to, let's say, a G. So that works really great. So we have right here, right? Or there it is there. Then, so my next one, well, I could do, uh, let's do right here. There's my B flat, slight bend, there's my root. And I'm going to maybe jump up the octave. If you want to be Steve Ray Vaughan about it, use your middle finger on that high note. Right? So I'm snapping with my middle finger. Right? So I'm just, that's that flat three. So everywhere I got, anywhere I can find it, open string. The only problem with that is you can't resolve, you can't vibrato that G. Right? Right? So right there, B flat, G, B flat, G, B flat, G, and I'll just do that. Together, you know. <laughs> right? 
right? Right? Now, one thing I don't want to do is release that B flat for the most part. You don't want to go. It can sound cool, but sometimes it doesn't sound cool. Just let me hear. Let me show you what it doesn't sound cool. Um, if I go, watch. But on a four chord, it's pretty cool. We'll talk about that Y in a second. But always that little bit of a tweak. All right, so it seems to be making sense, right? Just tweaking my flat three. Okay, the other one, um, all right, maybe I'll do four things today, <laughs> uh, is tweaking your flat at seven. So in this case, that's going to be my F. So same idea. I'm going to bend it a little bit. And I'm alluding to my G, which is up the whole step. Now, G7 is spelled G, B, D, F. So it's right in the chord. Right? So I'm bending it a little bit, keeping it going. And how long I take to bend the note is appropriate to the tempo of the song or how fast I want the lick to be. So if I go, or, Right, I always have it in motion. If I stop the note in mid, like if I stop it too soon, you hear it already, right? It's just terrible. It's the leaving it, the note in motion and how it pulls you forward to the next pitch. I can't tell you how to do that exactly other than you have to practice it because <laughs> the timing is always different depending on how you're, what you're playing over, right? So. I practice this the same exact way as I practice the other one. I'm going to find every F to G, and I'm going to resolve it. So, F to G resolutions. We're just tweaking and stopping it. Right? Right? The Jeff Beck lick, I'll show you that. Okay, so now if I put those two together, the flat three tweak and the flat seven tweak. Now watch this lick. So let's, let's work on that one. I didn't tab anything out for you guys. This is just about finding it yourself, but check out what I just did. Right down to G minor pentatonic scale, but I'm going to play. A little tweak. As opposed to listen, listen to the sound difference. Same lick. One, two, three. Four. So all I did there was B flat, then C, B flat, C, F, G. That's a kind of Jeff Beck thing. A little tricky. That was that Beck lick. cliche of mine as well that I stole from him. Okay, so flat three bend, flat seven bend.
or tweak. Um, next up, uh, let's call this uh, 2B as opposed to number 3. I'm supposed to do 3. YouTube's click. YouTube, apparently, thanks to my friend Keith Williams, loves those things. Three things you must know. Okay, so three and three and a half things. Uh, in, a, in a minor pentatonic scale, there's really only uh, one note I don't want to tweak, and that's the root. All right, so if I'm going to play... Right, if, I'm, if I bend that, that, that G, it sounds terrible because there's nowhere to go to unless I'm going to the A. And then we're not doing that. That's not the sound we're going for, plus it's not in the pentatonic scale. So I'm doing... Actually, two notes, two notes when I got to bend the pentatonic scale. Sorry, guys. Um, we're gonna bend, not going to bend the root. We're going to bend the flat three. We're going to bend the four because we're alluding to the five. Don't bend the five unless, yeah, don't bend the five just right now. Then the flat seven. So I have. There we go. Flat seven, flat three five, there's the four to the five. Four to the flat three. So I'm always tweaking the flat three, not the root. Always tweaking the flat seven, not tweaking the five. Always tweaking the, the four, always tweaking the flat three. And you get this really kind of loosey-goosey thing. That's uh, an official term for it. And I learned a lot of this from a very particular tune that I highly recommend. There's two, actually. And uh, Keith talks about them, Keith Williams. I did the music for this Beano, the GTM 45 thing, and we'll talk about this amp in a minute and what we're planning, he and I, uh, Keith from 5 Watt World. And uh, in his history of the Beano record, there's two songs that are on the, re the re-release of the Beano record. One is called Lonely Years. And i show you how to play that one or a version of it on my uh, solo, my Blues by Yourself course. No, no, my uh, 30 Authentic Blues Grooves course, which is, I learned so much from that. The other one is a tune called Bernard Jenkins. And man, like it, he's just doing everything I'm doing. Um, no, let me replace it. I'm doing everything he's doing. <laughs> so it's when I really got into him, uh, Eric Clapton, especially that period, uh, man, it was so great. It was so great. Then I started to hear those little... Like that, you. That kind of phrase. All those little things like that. Right? Now, I threw some of BB's boxing, but we're not going to talk about that today. He does a lot of that. And I have, if you want to go back in the archives, I have a, the whole video on BB's box. All right, so the third thing, and uh, this is really important too, is I'm going to mark where I am in the form of the tune by hitting the five chord. And you hear a very common Clapton lick. He does it in his crossroads of variation. Right, so you know in that five chord, it's like... Or even just going and like see sleepy time where he goes like yeah. Then he goes uh the, that kind of sound you see really hitting that five chord. And what I like about that is it sounds really cool. It shows you you know where you are in the form. And the more musicians you play with and the better you get and the level of people you play with, when you mark those things, those, those time, it, it's, it's almost like, it was funny, Keith Williams, Keith and I have been talking, we're talking about a video we're doing together, we've been blabbing a little bit, it was his idea. This lesson was Keith's idea today. He's like, why do you talk about that? Because he's got my British Blues course where I talk about a lot of this stuff. And he was saying a very something that really, I, I thought was really cool 
that I take for granted with the, the people I'm fortunate to play with. Uh, when I mark that five chord, it's almost saying to them, I'm listening to where you are. I know exactly where we are. We're actually playing together. So one thing you should practice as you go through this, and I won't make you sit through the whole one, is every time you go to your five chord, make sure you mark it with the root. So that's going to be the D. So... And you know, and the turn out. Right? I'll do one more. So we're here all day. Right? So, just every time I go through, it doesn't have to be really complicated, just, or just, or even, and hitting that. And what's cool is you don't always have to play it, uh, the, the band doesn't have to play the five chord. And so if they're just doing like, sorry. If you, even while they're just doing that, they don't play it. As a soloist, it's really cool to mark that. So, um, here's Stevie Vaughan do it, Albert King, Freddie King, Albert, you know, BB King, everybody does it. Come on, everybody does it. Right? I'm really not marking the time yet or the feel. There you go. So at first I was just kind of playing blues licks and a bad note. I was just playing some blues licks, but I wasn't outlining the sound of the chord changes in my playing. Uh, which is something I talk about all the time you want to do, but in this case I wasn't. And uh, it gets to the point like, well, what chord is he on? If you're not counting the time, you don't really know. But as soon as I went like... like you get to like, there is that five chord. So that's um, super important as well. So once again, to recap, you want to bend flat three, and you can resolve that to anywhere you want. You can resolve it up to the four. Well, you usually resolve it to a chord tone. I was ma mainly resolving it to my root today. I can resolve it to the, th resolve it to the five. Down. All right, so that's cool. There's a five chord link. Right? you guys realize I'm going out of my way to sound like early Eric Clapton? <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, one of my favorite uh, hobbies, because I just love it so much. Or a sound as close as I can. You know what I mean? All due respect, he's the man. Bernard Jenkins, Lonely Years, those two tracks were really uh, door-opening mind expanding for me and he was like what like early 20s on it makes me it kills me here i am uh twice that plus some and then uh we're still working on the same thing so it's so great how amazing he was back then and still is of course but that period blues breakers and cream for me is just where he was you know amazing and i still love clapton now because you know some people are like oh, blah, 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 and i'm like you're an idiot he's eric clapton great songwriter great singer, 
and he's Eric Clapton. So, you know, you can say what period you liked better than others as a player, but I love all those 70s records. Those are great tunes, you know, and he, he, he could do whatever he wants. You know, at one point, I think he just said he got tired of, like, the, cre the cream jam thing. It's his prerogative, and then he put out, you know, man, put out, you know, Let It Rain and, and man, the core, like, all that great stuff. Anyway, okay, so... <laughs> So he was so influential when you hear uh, Peter Green, who certainly had some of Clapton in him earlier on, and then when Mick Taylor replaced Peter Green in the Blues Breakers, very Clapton-y, right? You know, that he sounded, he was so influential because, you know, you hear this guy doing this, and you're like, wow. And they had Les Pauls, and they were playing through Marshalls, and it just kind of came out that way. Okay, so, so once again, we have our flat three tweak. We have our flat seven tweak. Or we can end it. We just don't want to go. And you know, we can vibrato, but if I vibrato that B flat, I want it to be kind of a bigger vibrato so it gets some of that. But if you're moving through it, and then we can also tweak our four. So it's kind of cool, watch. So I bend, fret, bend, bend, fret, bend, bend, fret, <laughs> bend, right? So all of those, it's really great. So So it gets kind of you can be kind of silly like You know you can kind of practice that. And finally uh the 5 chord on your turnaround. Just find that and you can just play the D on the 5 chord just you know doesn't matter you don't have to go this is a big one. That's a big one. So flat three, natural three to the D, then you go down the octave. So, or you could just have gone, yeah. As long as you're hitting that five chord when the five chord should be coming around in the changes. All right, there you go. That's three things you must know, excuse me. I had my espresso before the, uh, broadcast all right so questions anyone let's talk about gear and what I'm doing and all that stuff you know um, so first up let's talk about the amplificator Went wrong way all right that is a Marshall origin 20 watt combo and um, what what I have coming up with uh, with Keith is Bino on a budget. We were talking about how to get this kind of guitar sound within um, a, a reasonable amount of money, you know? I mean, obviously, there's certain things that I'm using that are not reasonable amounts of money. But that amp, it came in. Uh, Marshall sent it over. I've got a friend over there. And holy poop, that thing is really good. I'm shocked at how good that amp is. Uh, you're listening to the aux, which is, you know, right there. I keep on going, there. where is the aux? There it is. So I'm not playing. It's at 20 watts, and, you know, 20 watts is loud, and it goes down to 5 watts and then 0.5 watts. And um, I'm setting it pretty traditional. It's a more traditional-sounding amp anyway, as opposed to uh, more of a metal sort of thing. But we can get some of that, like, JCM 800, if you're into, like, that kind of, you know... Um, that sound which i love too so that's this thing right here i think they're like 400 bucks or something this is the 110 combo um i like it a lot i would so much so that i'm gonna i'm gonna end up keeping it because i think it, it really see, suits a certain sound that i don't have and it's not a 100 watt super lead which is super big and heavy so if i want to bring a marshall sound um for the price of an expensive pedal 
a very expensive pedal, but um, listen, to that I mean, you know, that's just the amp, you know. That's all I've got going on is the amp. Now, um, I would probably myself at this point replace the speaker because yeah, in budget amps, it's usually the speaker is one of the weak spots, and I have plugged it into my uh, 112 cabs, and I think it it definitely sounds better. Uh, as I think a 112 cab always sounds better than a 110 combo. But, you know, in your house, going to gigs, like a little gig sitting in, it, it's great and it's plenty loud. But uh, mainly for the money, not even for the money, it's just a good sounding amp that they put out. So I'm, I'm not uh, getting paid by Marshall to talk about it. I'm just overwhelmed at how good it is, especially for the price range. It's just, you know, especially if you're just kind of playing at home and all that, some great stuff. Okay, uh... Uh, the guitar is not a guitar on a budget <laughs> at all. Uh, it's a 1952 Les Paul. So this was formerly owned by Robin Ford, and you can see him playing it in a lot of videos. And uh, we uh, worked out a buddy deal. He's the man. You should have this guitar. He, like, he moves through things like water. And he wasn't really into the P90s, so he just got some of the P90. He wasn't necessarily into the... He was just always on the, the lookout for things. And I played this guitar, and it's just a, it's a magical guitar. And then we came to, uh, we came to terms, and um, I sold a lot of things. And, uh, I, you know, it was one of those things, like, you know, one, how many times in a lifetime does, you know, your friend slash hero say, yeah, I want you to have this guitar. Let's figure this out. So um, I, I did what I had to do, and um, that's kind of it, because I... <laughs> <laughs> so it's the P90s. As you saw me messing around, I got to send it in to get worked on, because everything is original, and the pots... Uh, I, I Holger Notzel down in, in, um, down in uh, Louisiana, uh, Baton Rouge, who did refretted my old Strat. He runs... He makes Comet amps, and... Um, these are the original pots, so they get, he, he's a great at restoration work, so the original pots, I gotta do something with, they're kinda dirty, so if I, I can't go to the neck pickup right now, it just, it just isn't working, it's just kinda dirty of, you know, 60 years of, of gunk, so there you go. Um, so, uh, and people say, wow, that's a really expensive guitar. Yeah, it is. Um, It's what I do for a living. So, um, you know, it's nice to have some of these guitars, very fortunate. Um, and what's cool about it is they, re for recording and things, they just have a certain sound and they're just magical. When you find a great old guitar, there's, there's nothing like it. Now, all the other guitars I have are spectacular. But, you know, you don't necessarily want to go traipsing around all over the place with this. But, um... As people say, like guitars, especially old ones, they it sounds corny, but it's totally true. They have a they have a song in them, always, or they have something in them. And you start playing this, and I just sit on the couch, even unplugged, and it's just the way it just vibrates, and you know. And like I said, you know, this is in the round I'd done touring with Robin. I'd played it a bunch, and um, I loved it, and it's just great. And, you know, uh, anything like this, if it's just, you know, anything o older or younger, older than this, not older, younger, would be like a 57 or something like that. You know, then you're talking about there's no, there's no possible way, even with working out a deal, I could ever afford anything like that. You know, you're talking over $100,000, and this is nowhere near that. And um, so, yes, uh, that's what this is. I am overjoyed to own it for many reasons. Uh, one, primarily my hero and very good friend, uh, Robin, worked it out. He played it in a lot of gigs, and he loves it, and he loved the guitar, but he was just, you know, he wanted to move on to something else and, you know, doesn't want to have a bunch of guitars that are sitting around that have to fund the next thing that you get because we're all like that. Okay, there's the long thing. Um, okay, so... Yeah, okay, he's right. It's it's the wood. It ain't the trees, bro. You're, I'll get to the little questions, but that is so totally true. 
that this is old growth mahogany and it was old in 1952. So you can't get it anymore. You know what I mean? Brazilian rosewood, they just don't exist. And um, Robin and I have these conversations. Like, you know, the, a lot of these guitars, they are only owned by really, really, really rich people. And it's kind of a bummer in a way because players don't get a chance to really play them. And um, so, like I said, th this short window of time came about. I'm not trying to justify, but you can understand, like, you know, who I got it from. We worked something out. It's a beautiful guitar. And uh, I just want to play it. It's just this other level of, of, of music that can come out of these things. Um, and I love the PRSs and I love the Michael Tuttles. Uh, but they're all trying to sound like the old ones, really, largely. So um, there we go. All right. And, you know, other things like, I, I, you know, I live in New York. I don't really drive a car. I don't, you know, all these things I don't do that a lot of people do. And I'm like, well, your car costs a lot more than my guitar. So there we go. All right. Uh, okay, so that was that. Um, at one point, um, I stepped on a little bit of a boost just to kind of nerd out on that for a second. And that is from uh, Comet, Holger Notesel. They have this thing called the Marisol, which is sort of like a, it's, a, it's an amazingly good clean boost. And um, what I love about it, here, let me just talk about his pedal for a sec. What I think is really great, watch, I'm going to put the, the boost on zero and turn it on off. It's on, off, on. There's like really no tonal difference, which is killer. So when, it, when it's on zero, it's, it's unity gain. There's like no difference when it's on and off. So it's a really just more. So I'm going to turn that up. So there's the boost. Now Clapton wasn't using that, a boost. Using humbuckers would be more output, and I can plug that in a second. So that's the clean boost side. And then it's got this thing called heat, which is like a treble boost, which Clapton was not using on those records, contrary to popular belief that I've pretty much confirmed. So I get more highs. So if I turn the heat. So yeah, well, you know. So you can boost, you can mix the two. I just had it on a little bit of a volume boost just to make up for some of the pickup loss for the P90s as opposed to the humbuckers. So that is the Marisol boost by Comet. I really, really love it. Um, it's a great, it's a great pedal. Uh, so many great pedals out there. Okay, so that is, uh, that's the rundown of the gear. But yeah, guys, like I said, you know, that thing sounds amazing. I'm really shocked at how good it sounds. So let's, oh, just for fun, um, and, it, oh, and if everything sounds kind of like uh, the, the Beano records, because I'm, I'm working on that right now. I'm trying to get that sound on purpose. So let me, um, hold on. If I put um, the humbuckers through it, you can hear that. And this will be without the boost and then with the boost and all that. Okay, so. That's right. Almost more of the right envelope, you know. Right? So that's more of like the envelope that um, that the guitar gets. So one thing about, uh, that brings me up to one, one point. So let me just play one more thing. It's about the scale length. And that is huge. To so get that sort of clapton -y sound, and if I go to the fantastical PRS that I have here, check it out. Same scale length. <laughs> He's 
these are uh, less output pickups than the other one. So in this case, it's a little darker because of lower output. I might di dial in some of that heat. Right? This is so much easier to play. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the other ones are difficult, but this is like a, this is easy, easy, easy. Okay, so um, let's get to some questions. I know I'm blabbing there. All right. Uh, all right. Besides country, what make, oh, besides the country, what makes it sound like British blues? Okay, that's a good question. You know, I think it's the approach. It's the more overdriven. <laughs> You know, that's a more aggressive. Um, the, the sound, it, to me, it's the tone and just the, the aggression, like Zeppelin, you know, and uh, uh, Fleetwood Mac and Cream. It was just that mixture of rock and roll, a little more overdrive. And I, I think it's just that oh, I, I, a little more technique with the guitar players from where they were coming from, you know, say if it was based upon a... Um, a uh, if they're listening to Albert King and Albert Collins and all that, um, Clapton had more chops in general than those other guys, right? I mean, uh, he just there's a different sort of sound going on um, in terms of the technique. And the amps, like the, the Marshall sounds versus some of the other stuff. So I think to me that's what, what, what kind of puts it together that way. Um, it's heavier. And that's what got me into it. And then I went back and, and relearned and, and listen to the guys they would talk about, Howlin' Wolf and things like that. Would you bend the flat through the major three? And this is from uh, Michael Fuchs. Yeah, man, totally. I could do that too. So I get that like... Absolutely. Now, um, sometimes in different fields more than others. Maybe in this one, I don't love the way it sounds, but you're taking like a slow blues. Right? Right? Sure. Right. So definitely you could bend that flat three to the natural three. Um... Okay. Um, all right. I discussed the amp. Uh, who would you regard as the greatest British blues player of all time? Clapton. Because, you know, even you guys know I love Peter Green. Um, just as Clapton was the, the first guy to do it that way. I think he defined it. This record, the Beano record, the sound of it, he defined this through that, you know, like a Les Paul through a Marshall. And I think, so for me, it's Clapton. It always comes down to Clapton. And I love Peter Green. I love Peter Green. Um, but generally speaking, on the whole of that era, also musically, song-wise, which is very important, I can listen to more of Eric Clapton's output than all of the Peter Green catalogs. I find, I know I always get in trouble for these comments, um, I found some of the, the early Fleetwood Mac ca uh, records spotty. There's some moments of absolute brilliance, primarily the Peter Green driven material. And there's the other stuff, which is really cool, but it's just, it's like a, it's a, it's an English blues band. So some of it sounds very much of its time. When I hear Clapton play and Peter Green on his great stuff play, it still sounds fresh to me. So when I listen to Bernard Jenkins and those songs I was talking about, even today, I'm still completely blown away at how, I don't feel like I'm listening to a, music like a, uh, a museum piece or something like that. I feel like I'm listening to something, a living and breathing thing that was happening at that moment. Okay. Um, so, oh, David Hamburger's here. I didn't say hi to David. Are you still here? Of Fretboard Confidential. 
Uh, David Hamburger, one of my close, closest friends for, God, many, many years. And David was the one who brought me into True Fire, actually. Went when the, from the ground up there. So, um, hello, David. Uh, ba -ba -ba. I'm currently Googling 52 Les Pauls. <laughs> um, okay. Looking, looking, looking. Questions? So, yeah, you know, the, the new, uh, new Les Pauls are great. This is a new Les Paul. It's great. Is it as great as that? No, but it's, it's really close. You know, the new ones can be spectacular. So I'm not in any way saying that new guitars aren't as good as old guitars because those PRSs are, and the Tuttles are just spectacular. Um, you just, unless it's made from old wood, and then if that old wood has been vibrating for 60 years, you know, being played, that's important. I've had the opportunity to play a lot of vintage guitars, and some of them just stink. They're just old, and they they don't sound very good. That's 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 what people think. Oh, it's old. It's got to be good. Definitely not true. I played some Telecasters, like a fi early '50s Tele. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to play it. And first of all, it weighed like a ton, and it sounded like it was completely dead and horrible. I've played some vintage Strats. I'm like, I would not buy this. I've played a few '58s and '59s. A '58 in particular, I played it. And I'm like. Yeah, it's it would be it's it felt like a nice reissue. Didn't have anything that really blew me away. So it's not it's not across the board that they're all great. Okay. Uh what else here? Early Food Mac is terrific. What PRS is that? It is a five ninety four. Um Okay, uh, McCarty 594, yep. Hey, Keith, Keith's here now. Um, and like I said, we're doing that video coming up together. And we did the one, if you don't, if you haven't checked that out already, um, at 5 Watt World, I did a, I played the music and I supplied the music for Keith's awesome video on the JTM 45 and Plexi Style amps, which uh, was a ton of fun. And uh, I played this one on it. And just since we're talking gear, I got really super fortunate with this one. Well, in one way, I found it at a, at a guitar store here in Manhattan, Carmine Street Guitars. Many years ago, my friend uh, Rob called me up, and he had a, an old Marshall, a big one. He said, I've got one on. They're, they're blowing this thing out for like 800 bucks, so I bought it for $800. And um, I got really lucky, and, but I had to put a lot of money back into it um, because it was all modded out. So over time... It, it was expensive to get modded, but it wasn't expensive as buying an old one. And it's a good one, so I'm just holding on to it. I don't get a chance to use it that much for many reasons. One, um, it's really loud. And also the 100 watts are really heavy. And I don't know if you guys have ever picked up a 100 watt Marshall. The transformer, I forget which side it's on until I pick it up. And then you know is on one side or the other, and you pick the thing up and it goes whoop, like it just tilts all the way. So carrying one of those around is not the uh, pretty much, uh, it's not it's not really easy to kind of tote around. So it's for specific gigs, and I love it. I love it. I love it. But as you guys know, I'm working with, I do work with and play two rocks. And um, I really love that Bloomfield drive because it gets kind of in between. It, I can get, it's dumbly, but kind of marshally. It's got a lot of the characteristics I like about Marshalls. But it has the clean tone that I really love. Um in fenders, which, um, let's talk about Marshalls for a minute. So, uh, I think Keith, you said earlier, you can get a Marshall, you can get a fender to sound like a Marshall a little bit, to a certain extent, but you can't really get a Marshall to sound like a fender. And unless you're using like a JTM 45, I can get fendery with this, like this thing, surprisingly, a good super lead and super bass can actually get some great clean guitar sounds. Um, really thick, and you hear Hendrix play them really, really, really full clean guitar sounds. But um, generally speaking, you're going to get more of those out of a, uh, a Fender. Yes. Thank you, guys. Yes, it is my birthday today. And Phil, thank you so much. I was going to have him feel you sent me um, some nice bottles of wine. I was just going to start drinking it now and, uh, you know, online. Can I do that? Okay, so, yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, birthday. 
no guy, I'd rather not spend with you, anybody else than you guys. I really appreciate everybody being here. And I love everybody that came over. Hi, everybody who's new. Um, coming over from 5 Watt World. Thank you, Keith, for pointing people uh, in my direction. Okay. Um, yeah, so you had a, Keith, you had a 50 Watt 800, and the cleans are amazing. Yeah, people think that Marshalls are just distorted amps. Not at all. Um, right now, see what? It's hard because you don't have the volume. So when we talk about clean, I hate pristine clean. I hate it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because it's very unforgiving. It. I like an amp. It used to be cliche. It's like kind of just about to break up. That's loud enough where the tubes are kind of doing something. Right. Right. So, when you have that kind of clean headroom before it breaks up, or you, you're just right at the edge of breaking up, the guitar and the amp kind of breathes and works with you. And that's what I like. So when people say a clean tone, I never want a super, super clean, clean tone. Um, yeah, who is older, me or the gold top? Uh, the gold top is older than me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what else we have here? Yes. Thanks, guys, for the happy birthdays, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so here is my... Um, we talked about some of this stuff with the sounds about these records, this guitar sound. Uh, a lot of it does have to do with the scale length of the guitar. And if you're going for the Beano sound or almost what's kind of thought about as a British blues sound. Yeah, I know, I know Clap, I know Page played a telly on some things. So play, Page, Page played a telly. And Clapton played a telly here and there. But with Cream and Blues Breakers, Clapton was always on a Marshall. Sorry, on a, on a Gibson. And um, Peter Green was always, almost always on that Les Paul. You know, so there's an envelope to the notes that you just don't get on a Strat. So let's just demonstrate. <laughs> Right? So let me get the... Hold on. Stepping off camera. So, if we hear that... You beside... It doesn't... Now I can fake it. Now in, in a perfect world, I'm a Strat guy still, but you definitely hear that. There's a definitely a difference to the way the envelope of the note yeah, it's not going to fall. Okay. So, if you can remember what the other one sounded like, and try to not think about um, the humbuckers, but... Right, so you hear that difference in the tone. Certainly, it's humbuckers and blah blah blah. But there is a s an envelope to the note. And when I first figured that out, was on the <laughs> you, that like that whole sound. You know, you know that whole you know. That sort of sound that Clapton was getting, uh, the way he'd bend those notes. Uh, so yeah, Tom and that singing a big block of wood helps. Yeah, there's all those things help, but what I've noticed when I went back with the PRS, which is a, that one's got a Gibson scale, to other guitars that don't have that scale, back to a Gibson scale and the PRS, they all live sort of in the same family more so. So that's important. If you really, really want to dig into the, the sonics of it, 
I'm sold on that idea. More so than humbuckers, because you heard the P90s, and you can kind of boost them a little bit to get into that, that sound range. Um, okay. Uh. Oh, when I plugged in the Strat, it became instant Derek and the Dominos. Yeah, right? <laughs> he went through a Strat. And it's, it's a very different sound. Um, and he used like Music Man at that point. Was he still using Marshalls back then? Fender amps and things like that. So I don't know exactly. I can't remember. I mean, I love that record. Um, but yeah, different setup. You can hear it too. But I think the main thing was uh, the difference in in the in the in the scale length. Now, look. You know, if you don't have a Les Paul on a Strat, you can do all the stuff on a Strat. It's about the actually. It's more about the playing. Like. <laughs> But if you want that kind of mid-range honk, right? Yeah, it's really a uh, lot to do with the Les Paul or the SG or something. All right. Um, oh, was it, it was a, a Tweed Champ? That's right. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would love to play Sensor in your Lobe, but they'll probably ding me on that. <laughs> Which brings me to just, what time is it? Oh, cool. We got, I got it. Um, so here's the, the fun for the day. Let's see if I can show. Um, this is what's going to happen later today. I'll report back. Hopefully it'll all work out. Hold on. This guy might be coming home with us uh, this evening. So Stan will have a friend, so that'll be fun. All right, I'll let you guys know. No name yet, but a little guy. So, bit of a bit of an animal lover over here. Well, at one point I had three dogs and two cats, so uh, suckers for the animals. Because <laughs> they make life so much better. <laughs> They're the... As you guys know, any dog owners and cat owners, everything is so much better um, with with an animal. Uh, well, that sounded weird. Life is so much more fulfilling when you have an animal in it. A dog or a cat. A birthday pup. Yep, totally. Um, okay, so what else? Oh, yeah, okay, once again, all my courses are available through my website, 25% off. Um, I discuss this kind of things in most of my courses. Uh, the British Blues, I, I talk about it in detail. And um, I, I, that's a cool course. I, I, I talk about that course a lot. And uh, yeah, call him Bino. You know, the funny thing is right now, uh, he, was, he is from Puerto Rico, and there's a, a group of people who, uh, a, an organization that brings them up to the New York area. And his name is Bean, which is really funny. At the moment, his name is Bean. But yeah, Bino is a thought for sure. That's cool. I think I think he said the same thing. Okay, cool. So um, can you comment on the modified pentatonic, minor pentatonic, that some of these British blues have used, substituting the flat seven for the six, which I use. Yeah, well, you've just said it right there. Um, absolutely, you can set, you can add in the six, and and if you look at my, because um, uh, that's another whole topic. If you go back on some of the, I talk about the BB's box in, in a previous episode, and I do talk about that. So basically, you're just replacing a flat seven with a six. Or add it in. Or that's that real BB King, you know? Yep. What am I doing here? There we go. That kind of sound. Yeah. 
The, the problem with the, with the name Beano, because anybody who doesn't know the record is probably going to think it's that thing that you put in your food when you're eating beans, right? So anybody <laughs> doesn't know that you named your dog after that, after gas stuff. So that's kind of a funny thing. Um, all right, any final questions, guys? We've gone for an hour. I so appreciate you all being here. Hopefully you learned something. Tweaking the flat seven, tweaking the flat three, tweaking every note, really, in a pounder pentatonic scale except for the root and the five. And then the turnaround, uh, hit nailing that five chord. Ugh. Right? Right? That note right there. All right, so. I will be here next week, every Wednesday, at um, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, any, uh, any final questions? Other than that, I appreciate it. Phil Mingan, thanks so much for doing this uh, every week. Phil, the fantastic Phil Mingan, who all you guys know. And all you guys, everybody who's here, SC Nesbitt, I'll give a shout out. Bro, Tom Sweet, Grandpa, Bob, Matt Gibson, um, bro, Jim Angelo, Greg Witt, uh, Michael Fuchs, Sam Stamos, Blues Boy Tony, Tom Manette, uh, Clive McGowan, Pendragon, Michael Fuchs. Man, everybody's here. Hey, Miguel, what's up, Miguel? Graham Ross, uh, Jason Carter. GLH1 1956, whatever. Yep, you know, these names that are so familiar and some new people. So awesome. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. John Shuck, Ron Peterson, Ken Kays. Um, yeah, Jimmy Dodd, what's up, man? All right. All you guys, thanks so much for being here. And I will see you next week. And while you're here, you know, if you guys want to jump on over to. Um, my Instagram page and follow me there. I, I don't page post as much on Facebook as I used to because that place is just, just bad news. <laughs> so I'm mostly over on Instagram posting things, but I'll see it. I do post in Facebook anything that's music related uh, from here. So, but please follow me over on Instagram. It really helps a lot. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel here, uh, thank you very much. And anybody who hit the tip jar today, Really appreciate that too. It helps me to do, keep on doing these things and uh, obviously pay for more and more dog food. So thanks guys and I will see you next week, same time.